I gave up painting around 1965, I think, and the reason for giving up painting was that I realized that I could probably do with photographs what I needed to do without resorting to painting. I think the first time I used photography in my work was pretty much as documentation of something. I had done a work where I had used a map of the state of California and a word California going down the length of the state. I would go drive to that spot where each letter was on the map. The C would be in Northern California and proceeding south to like the last letter would be A that would be somewhere, let's say, in San Diego near the Mexican border. Whatever materials I saw there, it might be rocks, it might be newspaper, I would make that letter in that location and photograph it. The next works, I, using a liquid photographic emulsion on canvas, made the photograph on the canvas so you could treat the canvas like enlarge, photographic enlarging paper. And the reason I did it on canvas was that I wanted to make it very clear that it was art. If one sees canvas and, and stretcher bars, automatically you know it's art. I devised all kinds of ways, which started early back in these National City work. I took photographs of just driving around the city in which I lived in, in the south of uh, California in a little city called National City, and I just had my camera outside of the car, not even looking through it, and taking what we call snapshots. and then I would note down the location, and the finished work would have the photograph, and a sign painter would write down the location that I had put on it. And I got that idea of just looking through books, documentary photography of some city, and saying, well, this is, you know, looking south on this street, and this is the city, or looking east here, and this is what you see. It's just very clinical, you know, not aesthetic. So I wanted these things to simply to have none of the qualities of conventional art, of beauty, just saying, well, it's pure document. I wanted to be kind of a realist, almost, let's say, like Courbet, saying, well, listen, this is where I live, and I'm not trying to make it pretty. A photograph, at least a black and white photograph, is nothing but oxidized silver on paper. And a painting, if we stay with black and white, again, is this carbon with an emulsification that goes on the canvas. Now, what's the difference? It's just di different materials. Now, I don't care about what f-stop it is or what the grain of the film or how the, you know, it, does the color look natural. Uh, you know, all of these things, or do I have enough grays in a black area or, or do I have enough white? I really don't care. I mean, it's the, it's the imagery that, that interests me. I had very much been interested all along in, in using what we would call found photography, let's say, and I think now we call it appropriation. You know, my idea is that I'm an artist using photographs, and now that's a fairly conventional idea, but at the time, it wasn't.
And I had this idea that if an image already exists, then there's no reason to make a new one. I might photograph things out of dictionaries or anything, any source. I would go to photographic processing uh, companies and go through their garbage bins to look for photographs that they would throw away and, and use those kinds of things. Or I would set up a camera outside my studio on a timing me mechanism so every 10 minutes they would take a photograph and then I would use that material. And then I began to do the same thing off of television. Uh, for instance, images off of the television. Then I would give them to my assistant and say, write on the back of it what you think this is, this one word. And then I would file them away like in a dictionary. And then I would use them as like language, except instead of using the word, I would use the image. I've always been interested probably in writing more than art history. And you know, I, and I see myself maybe as a, almost like a visual poet, and that sounds very romantic. But when I say poet, it's, it's like a writer that uses words very precisely, the best possible choice of a word, poet in that sense. And where I'm trying to create meanings that I might not get if I actually did use words but I always like to think that behind each image that I use, there is a word. Then I began to use movie stills and I began to collect them, to file them in different categories. And the most noticeable one would be people with guns. And very seldom would I use the complete image. Sometimes of an eight by 10, I might use maybe just one square inch. When I find a still, I indicate it with a, a red crayon, uh, how I want it cropped. And then, uh, since I've been you know, working rather large scale, they're copied on an 8x10 copy camera, so I get a very large negative. They're individual prints made on adhered to board, machine board, and then they're simply stacked one atop another and put in a frame. I think why I use uh, movies and TV is that's probably a more real world to most people than the real world. It's more familiar. Then I got to a point where I had these photographs, not from the movies, but mixed in movie stills of photographs from the newspaper, not from international news, but usually local news, like the mayor, the police chief, what have you, shaking hands with a dignitary. And I always hated those photographs. And I guess that's what the photographer says now, shake hands and smile. And I, I had these little round stickers that you use in stores and prices. I began to put them on top of the face. Then once I had these figures with their faces obliterated, I could begin to use them like players or actors in a stage play or a movie. Well, in this particular peace agreement, there was a kind of symmetry about it. 
Uh, there's somebody looking frontal. There's a, per a person on either side, almost like bookends, you know, holding the center section out. I get the handshake uh, aligned with the head here, and that I'm getting pairs of colors like red and green that are opposites, triads, uh, red, yellow, blue. In the history of art, I mean, especially contemporary art, that's a co fundamental color sequence. One of the things that I discovered when I moved from painting to photography was that photographers had to deal with given formats, uh, 8 by 10, 11 by 14, and the viewfinders and the cameras are, you know, adjusted uh, to that or vice versa. So recently that's kind of come back into my work, and I'm exploring panoramic cameras where you get a very long format. But again, I have this perverse streak in me, so where they basically made to do landscapes, I would just turn it so it was used vertically, so I could escape this conventional kind of height-width relationship. Since I gave up painting, I've always collided things, two images, three images, like a writer would bring two words together. And if you get the two right words, then you have some magic that happens. Usually, I'm looking for images that is unsettling, that it deals with the unpredictability of life. I like the vulnerability and the chanciness of life, but like to present the idea of stability and instability in the same context. Things happen that we don't like to happen, that the world isn't a calm place. Now, you know, I like to think that the world could open up under my feet any moment. It just, for the moment, it's not doing that. When I first came to Düsseldorf in the 1950s, I was very impressed by the Ruhr region. At the time, the Ruhr was still very active, with many blast furnaces, steelworks and mines. And I was always very moved to see these strange and manifold creatures slipping past my train window. We took our first photos together around 1958. At the time, we had an extraordinary 6x9, a Linhof. We began in the area of Siegen, which is where I was born. For me, this was important because it's a little bit autobiographical because nearly all my ancestors had worked in the mining industry, either as miners or in the blast furnaces.
Dann haben wir weitergemacht im Ruhrgebiet. Dann We then continued to photograph in the Ruhr region, then in the industrial regions of the center of France. And in 1965, we went to Britain for the first time, mainly the south of Wales. From 1972, we went to the United States several times, to typically industrial regions like Pennsylvania. Broadly speaking, you could say that heavy industry is our key subject. Heavy industry includes coal mining, steel, and the limestone industry. In the factories we visited, we first chose those buildings which bore the deepest traces of their form, extraction towers, blast furnaces, and limestone furnaces. But there were other buildings too, cooling towers for instance, water towers and heat recuperators. To put it another way, objects whose development followed an historical thread which can be compared and whose emergence is not accidental. For us at the time, we were trying to carry off these objects. I'll call them things, but we couldn't carry them off in their original form. By photographing them, we shrank them and turned them into images. Because we were convinced that in a very particular way they bore witness to their time architecturally and that this architecture was wholly related to an economy, or rather to the thinking behind an industrial economy. Then came the moment when I realized that these objects were doomed to disappear. For me, this was an architecture just as important as that of medieval quarries, which evoke for us the thinking of another age. We took a very large number of shots, firstly out of fascination and sentimentality, and they had to be put into order. We did the classification afterwards, having familiarized ourselves with these objects. We first defined the basic forms, but then, as time went on, we realized that these forms came in different varieties and subspecies. So we decided to put one photo beside the other, so as to create a typology, as we call it. And the variety of form was such that in classifying the photographs according to group, we brought out the tiny differences between each object, in groups of 9, 12 or 15, which resulted in a sort of harmony. In each typology, each object corresponds to another. There are horizontal, vertical, and diagonal correspondences. And when you look at these objects, it's very important that number one still bears some relation to number 15, for instance, the last image. Uh, 
Der Wasserturm ist eigentlich ein ganz einfaches Gebilde. A water tower is basically quite a simple structure. It's an elevated container. Und es ist ein Wunder, dass Yet it's surprising the types of water towers there are. Diese Ausprägung reicht von from simple wooden barrels which you see on the roofs of buildings in New York, to much more refined ornamental structures. Despite this, they all have the same function. They produce pressure and serve as reservoirs in case of shortage. And if we line them all up, one beside the other, they evoke a certain spirit of an age or a way of thinking. In nearly all cases, we photograph them using a telephoto lens so as to avoid distortion. Sometimes we used a very long lens, up to 600 millimeters. So we had to work with two tripods to avoid the slightest vibration. This photo is part of a series of twin water towers. It wasn't very easy. We had to take the shots in winter. In summer, branches hid the lower parts. We drove out there several times. I think it was in 1962 or 1963, until we had the right weather conditions. And we had to wait for a foggy day, so that the background would disappear, because we didn't want to tamper with the images. We were also interested in the surrounding workers' gardens, because they were typical of railroad water towers. We nearly always photographed blast furnaces from a wide angle, from nearby furnaces in most cases. While we photographed the upper parts, which we called the head, as things apart. In such cases, we also worked with a telephoto lens. In our work, exposure time is relatively long. First, because of the large format we use, we have to adjust the aperture so that the opening is very small to get a very accurate image. Secondly, we nearly always work on cloudy days when there isn't much light. When we work with a long exposure time, closing the lens down to 32 or 45, we keep the shutter open for 20 seconds. It's a lovely moment counting to 20. We are very concentrated and oblivious to everyone. Man is very concentrated and is not ansprechbar. The viewer might feel that there is no question of composition. On the contrary. For certain objects, it's very simple. We compose the center of the shot and keep a little of the surrounding environment, what's to the left and right, above and below. One thing is absolutely important, the horizon. How do you bring the horizon in? It must be below the three-quarter line of the object, so as not to interfere with the effect. For more complex objects, framing becomes very important. Und gerade dann, wenn 
Above all, when taking perspective shots, where you have to be careful about how lines run, in such a way as they don't run straight into the angle, or that there isn't a white object in the top or the bottom of the shot, which would really disturb the composition. The formats we use are relatively standard ones. In the beginning, a 30 by 40 format suited us quite well. Later, for single photographs, we tried using a 50 by 60 format, which could be hung separately in a museum or on a large wall, because otherwise, being too small, they would have got lost. For me, the purpose of photography is to see in an objective way. Why should I try to project my own sentiments or my state of mind onto something which is already expressing itself? Of course, objectivity is the opposite of subjectivity. We have trouble separating the two, one beginning where the other leaves off. And objectivity doesn't mean that the truth has been found. Far from it. It means that the object represented is allowed to speak for itself. What is certain is that photography is related to death and the past. Because the moment you take a photograph of something, three minutes later it's something that no longer exists. Which also means every time you try to preserve something, you kill it. It's the same as putting something behind glass in a museum. It's the image of the object, but it's not the object itself. So, in fact, photography saves, saves and kills at the same time, saves and, in the end, evokes the idea of something that no longer exists. A few years ago, I did this piece entitled Menschlich, meaning human, but because I did it in Germany, it's called Menschlich. It's a very big piece because it consists of 1,200 photographs all faces. And their faces I had already used in previous works, and which come from very different sources. You've got uh, Spanish criminals, which I found in a paper called El Caso. And at the same time, a lot of criminals and victims from 1960s issues of Detective magazine, members of the Mickey Mouse Club, French and German photo albums, and quite a few Nazi photo albums I found in Berlin. Photographs of pupils from Jewish schools in the pre-war years. Photographs of dead Swiss people, ordinary dead Swiss people. Because I had a lot of these photos at home, over 6,000. They died afterwards. I mean, they were living Swiss people. And I chose the Swiss because there's no historical reason why they should die. They are the embodiment of happiness and neutrality. 
Nevertheless, they died. And so they seemed more universal for me, and I couldn't have done the same piece with dead Jews or even dead Germans, whereas the Swiss can represent everyone. What surprised me was how, in the end, they all look alike. They've all got the same face, and anyone looking at them can see a brother or an uncle or a sister. This is to say that when you've got 1,500 faces from a given society, it's a collective portrait in which everyone can see himself, and in which, of course, both the good and the bad look all alike, and perhaps are the same. And what also interested me when I did this piece was that there was a certain cemetery-like calm. I mean that we no longer know anything about these people. All these people are dead, but we no longer know anything about them. And the only thing we can say is that they were human. But it's impossible to say who was happy and who wasn't. It's a notion of vanity. They've all become equal. And I think that photographs of people have this terrible quality. They say this person existed, but they tell us nothing about them. We just know that they were someone. So all these images, all these people, Spanish criminals as much as dead Swiss, have been with me all my life. I know a little, but not very much about them. I mean, I know who is who, but for the visitor, they're all the same. There's a sort of absence of identity. And what I've always found more or less interesting is the contrast between the fact that each person is unique and that each person is so quickly forgotten. It's because someone is really someone. And for a long time I tried to preserve what I call intimate memory. This means that someone is someone because he knows, for example, where to buy a good quiche in Paris. He knows two or three jokes. He knew what love was and he could talk about it. And then all this, which makes up a person, very quickly, completely vanishes. From the very beginning, when I started working with photo albums, it became clear to me that photo albums are common to everyone, in our society at least, and they are nearly always interchangeable. And in fact, photography, especially amateur photography, does not try to depict a reality, but obeys a kind of code. I mean, it's something everyone already knows. Everyone knows what can be shown. And the subjects are all more or less the same. Going away on holidays, the beach, birthday party, the baby's born. And so these are types of moments which anyone can identify with and which are already in the mind's eye even before the photograph is taken. And so, in fact, we are not capturing reality, we are producing clichés, to use the French term. I often try to blur these images so people can identify with them more easily. I mean, I erase people's features a little, just so that people can recognize themselves or someone else, someone they know. The eternal problem is that I have always used groups of images, groups of people, because I have real trouble choosing 
I mean, why should I choose this face rather than this one? So I have trouble isolating an image. Why this one? Why make this choice? If you've got 500 faces, the question of choice isn't quite as important, it's a category. The images I found at a flea market in Berlin are from photo albums from the 1940s. What moved me, what interested me, was that they were photographs like you would find in any photo album, where you see a father with a baby, the Christmas party, that sort of thing. And there's a sort of contrast between this sort of good life this life which is so normal, and what we all know was going on at the time. I mean that you can kill a child in the morning and kiss your own in the afternoon. If a Nazi were so easy to recognize, so ferocious, it wouldn't be quite as dangerous. But they are us, they're our neighbors, normal people who can sometimes do terrible things. Someone said, you die twice, you die when you die, and you die a second time when someone picks up your photo and no one knows who you are. And it's very strange how we remember a face in a photograph better than a real face. I mean, that when someone dies, we remember the photograph of that person, but not the person. So I've always been interested in imagining what the image will be, what will be the image that remains. The photographic image replaces the face. And at the same time, everyone is irreplaceable. And at the same time, everyone is actually replaced. Not replaceable, but replaced. One of the few and last occasions I actually took photographs was during my five-year stint as a school photographer in Voiron, a small village in the centre of France. Near this village there was an old chateau which had a contemporary art collection. Every year I took photos there of the children and the photos were sold to the parents for a small sum, I mean for the price of a class photo. And I ran an extra set of prints for display in the chateau. And because I'm a bad photographer, I had real trouble taking these photographs. Once or twice, I even had to go back there, get the children to come back, because I'd put my hand in front of the lens, I'd forgotten to set the flash. And what I found interesting about the photos parents bought was that they had a practical value. They could be sent to grandparents to say, the little one has grown. And these same photos, when they were in the chateau, had an exemplary value. So they were artworks, if I may say so. So when they lose their practical value, they become exemplary. For me, almost simultaneously, but I don't know which came first, there were words and images, images and words. When I was about 10 years old, I wanted to be a poet, but also a photographer. Self-portraits, including these passport photos taken in local photo booths, were my first practical experience, a cross between capturing the real and a mise-en-scène, of the self-reflected, of the self-projected.
a narcissistic pursuit in the fixing of a proof, an exercise in self-seduction. In photography, I immediately saw two ways of proceeding, to collect the visible or to produce it. Later, my preference was for the latter, to bring out, make visible what is invisible to the naked eye, to call up from reality people and things so as to have them submit to my desires, to the contours of my imagination. At 15 or 16, under cover of my photographic ambitions, I persuaded my sister to undress and to pose for my first nudes. Later, having bought my first 24 by 36 reflex, I set out to collect sundry images like these Parisian gutter stops made of rags and old clothes and which sometimes evoked macabre remains, torn flesh, strips of skin. For me, these were as wonderful as bodies, paintings. Oddly, I then came to use these materials for the production of images, where the female body would be and remain the central focus. I projected onto a naked body slides of cracked walls, fences, tree bark, ripped posters. The result, very different from a double exposure, compressed the projected image and the body as screen one upon the other, the former bringing surface texture and color, the latter depth, volume, contours. To be nuder than nude, the body is clothed in an image. Projected images soon turned me to reflected ones. Aside from the wordplay in the title Miroir Tiroir, the mirror drawer device plays a genuine game of appearance and disappearance. In the to and fro of a drawer opening then closing, the mirror inside partially reflects the body of the model posing beside it. From drawer to drawer, from mirror to mirror, a body appears in its entirety, immobile in the midst of all this movement. Unlike the camera which watches it, the mirror drawer, or the drawer mirror, captures an image only if it is open. Once closed, it no longer contains anything. I have often revisited the optical machinery of the mirror in movement, returning to the camera to leave there the trace of the images it has captured. Here, a small mechanical toy which evokes the happy days of childhood tows a light mirror along the floor. As it wends its meticulously plotted and repetitive way, it returns to the camera pointed at the floor the reflection of an image projected on the wall, where hang paintings for grown-ups. Thus captured are some famous nudes, then other women, snatched from academic painters after all, a beautiful model is a beautiful model. Such images depend for their success on a number of tricks, and the result is secured only in the darkroom. They put paid to the idea that a photo is the trace of something that has been. Nothing has ever been thus. The bathroom mirror, towed by a mechanical toy, returns to the camera, its shutter open, the reflection of a body scanned from head to toe. A movie shot, concentrated into one single photographic image. Photography is no longer an instant captured from the real. It is the real in a fiction of time. I've always preferred to invent and piece together strategies for my images, to control their coming into being from the start, rather than change it after the event. Photos like these are like movie shots with changes of position, lighting, start and end of an action. But here time, whose unfolding is docilely followed by the film inside the camera, is compressed and flattened in a single image. Time spreads over a surface. Photography is an art of time much more than an art of the instant because unlike cinema, too mechanically enthralled to time, it resists it and in so doing exposes and reveals it. It exposes itself to what time inflicts and shows us the scars.
Les voyages parallèles. Parallel journeys is a series of variations on the theme of reading in trains, where the physical transportation of a body between two stations is echoed by the free movement of the imagination. The staging of an image containing people and objects, the play with projections and reflections, the spatial overlaps and differing perspectives, create an unlikely image which leads one to believe that this is a montage or a darkroom effect. Everything, however, happens at the moment of the shot. It's what the camera saw. Prior and concurrent to these studies, other trails led me to look through photography at how certain objects look at us. Many everyday household utensils are made from materials which reflect the surrounding decor and also the face and the body of the person using them. Each object maintains a special relationship with its surroundings, a shape-distorted reflection. Did I perhaps glimpse a distant memory of a teapot in which one afternoon I saw my grandmother's face reflected? A reflection recollected like an old perfume. Photography is also where the present shifts, is instantly peopled with ghosts. As soon as they developed and were framed, I re-photographed these Polaroid portraits, the model looking on, her face appearing again, a reflection at the edge. Between the first shot and the second one, one or two minutes have elapsed. The development time for the Polaroid image, during which the subject has aged. Mirror frames are like magic objects, confounding theory. As well as organizing space between the shot, the image within the frame, and space outside the shot, the imageless space beyond the frame, they summon up the third dimension of the counter shot, the place where the gazer stands, glimpsed in the surface of the frame's rectangular sides, and in a sort of counter frame taken from the counter shot between the shot and outside it. Between reflective metal containers and mirror frames, there are mirror caskets made to house a few modest treasures at which capture the surrounding world from all angles. At once, boxes full of secrets and image traps, perhaps so the secrets can hide in the midst of images. A physical and optical ideal is realized in the transformation of a bouncing ball game into a game of reflections. A mirror in the form of a table tennis bat can be used both to stop and return a ball, stop and return the image of a ball. Between the rebound and the reflection, a heady acceleration is produced. The latter occurring at the speed of light, we can dream of the image in advance or of an object arriving after its image. The photographic image is this dream space. I was greatly interested in another reflective material, tin foil wrappers for chocolate bars, which, unlike photographic paper, also silvered, does not retain a memory of light, but one of forms. Its physical properties make of it a surface which both reflects and takes on a form, it can be used as an interface between photography and objects which can be photographed. I picked a few classic photographic subjects and introduced between the image and the object a material which hides as it reveals, which clings as closely as possible to its form, and which exudes a luminosity which comes from elsewhere. When the objects molded were sculptures, I took, for example, this sloughed off skin from the Lions of Rome. When it was my own face I molded, I obtained self-portraits behind the mask. The likeness is lost, like a mummy whose skin, which nevertheless has enveloped the body, no longer holds to its physiognomy. A double contact has occurred. The silver paper impression of a face or an object, and the silvered photographic paper recapturing the print of this print.
Si le papier d'argent If tin foil is a fractal mirror without the rigidity of glass, glass is a false mirror without the reflective power of silver. Pourquoi un objet en How can a glass object be seen and photographed when it should disappear, make itself scarce, transversed by images of the place where it stands? I found this answer. Unlike opaque objects, glass does not carve out its space in the visible through superimposition. It takes shape in light by amplifying it. It does not absorb, it radiates. It does not create an absence, but an excess. From city to city for over a decade or so, I return to one of photography's more fascinating properties, its projectability. Turning the classical notion of wireistic photography on its head, these images explore photography's exhibitionist quality. Projected in cities at night, on walls and roofs, on facades and curtains, into apartments themselves, these pornographic photos are a sort of assault on propriety, even though they're only a rather banal representation of everyday sexuality, or in any case, of the most common sexual fantasies. With these luminous, large-scale exhibitions, photography becomes the urban imagination at night. The confrontation between obscene images and buildings with countless windows, the lights still on or already turned off in the intimacy of the bedroom, say in a certain way that what is on display here, blown up on the walls, is also what goes on inside, in the bedroom or in the mind. Amongst other sorts of artificial light, the city is lit by images. Who then is the photographer? Who the projectionist? My approach with photography from the beginning when I really had made a decision to use photography as a first order medium for my own artwork was, I would say, photography itself. And what we might call the subjects were a secondary thing. I began to examine in turn all the basic physical and chemical attributes of photography which are entailed in the production of a picture and try and force photography to break from its own conventions. So, for example, there's a work made in 1970 called 60 Seconds of Light and in that work, which says, in effect, what is photography? It is, in part at least, a combination of time and light. They're essential ingredients. So the subject is a photographer's darkroom clock. It has a black face and it has a white second hand. And as it moves, it's reflecting white light because it is painted white. And because the background is black, the trace of the white motion remains on the negative. This is what happens through the 12 pictures, and this segment of white becomes progressively larger. So the whole work becomes very reflexive. It informs upon itself and makes very clear the means of its own production.
Following that, I began to make some triptychs which were related to the way one chooses to focus the camera. And the first way of doing this was by deciding that conventionally in photography, you could say there are three picture spaces. Within a field of view, we normally make a division between foreground, midground, background. And I started to focus in turn on the foreground elements, the midground elements, and the background elements, and to use a very, very shallow depth of focus so that each of these pictures was in focus, then it went out of focus, then it came back in focus again, finally, in the background. So y you were still able to compare and contrast because all those things are present simultaneously. Photography's uh, history is clearly one of providing evidence in a very efficient and believable way. There is always photography doing its conventional and historical job of objectively recording things, but at the same time recording them through a set of fictional devices. Black and white photography, after all, is entirely fictive. It doesn't correspond with the way we actually see the world. I don't really believe in uh, absolute objectivity. And what interests me in part at least, is to open up a set of alternatives, even though you could say very often, in fact always, first of all, my photographs are constructed. There are fictional scenarios. The way I work is usually following a similar pattern. So I'm never seen wandering around with a camera. I simply don't work like that. I start by sitting at a table with paper, pen, and I use an old manual typewriter, not a computer. I'm trying to make diagrams, drawings, uh, little bits of writing to make a form of script for what I do. It's also a way of convincing myself of the plausibility of the scenarios I'm proposing. So there's a mixture of a kind of introduced fiction and a form of documentary realism, actually, mixed up together. What I'm calling documentary is part of what gives the final images some of their credence, and it's also what ties them to a history of photographic use. When I'm shooting pictures for a finished piece of work, ordinarily I'm using a medium format camera, 6.6, 6.7. A lot of my finished works are relatively large, a format of around 
four foot by five or 130 by 160 centimeters, that kind of size. I'm not only interested in the image that's provided, I am interested in the objective presence of the work itself. As a physical presence, there's still something to confront, something to contend with. If you started to make a list of photography's conventions, you'd have to include a sense of apparent transparency of the photograph itself. You're being given an illusion of some other time, some other place. And one of the ways of breaking this transparency and this illusionism, and also figuration, because that's another predominant mode of the photographic, is to construct a kind of screen as part of the completed image, which deliberately obstructs the viewer from entering the very space they would like to enter with the eye and with the mind. And what they're confronted with within that territory, which is usually the larger and more central part of the image, is an opacity rather than a transparency. In making Backdrop in 2001, I was really interested, and still am interested, in the use of the monochrome. The grey is provided by a standard roll of photographer's backdrop paper, in this case, a mid-grey. Now, ordinarily, your point of view would be from the front side of that backdrop, photographing whatever it is that's placed in front of it. My point of view, in this case, is from the rear. Now, what is the centre of the real photographer's attention and what's clearly the object of the attention of the surrounding models, we don't know. I did two things. I said to the photographers that they might also take their own pictures. The second thing is that instead of having nobody or nothing behind that backdrop, I had somebody. And the somebody is there, in fact, telling jokes in order to get the attention of the surrounding figures and in order to induce a real response. When I got the film processed afterwards in order to select the finished picture that I wanted to use, it's number 11 on the contact sheet, I also had the film processed by the real photographers. Of course, I'm in these pictures because they're in mine, so I'm lurking to one side in the shadows with my own camera. And that formula you could apply to a number of my works is a depositioning, a displacement of centre and periphery, of the opaque, the transparent, of the figurative, of the abstract, and very often also of the monochrome and something in full colour. I use words like obstruct, 
rupture, censor. I think it's a catalogue of words which is quite confrontational. And I mean to confront the spectator's uh, received ideas of how to approach pictures. And I mean to contest the picture's own conventions of recording and transmitting information. It's part of my character, I think, that I always need to be asking why. You know, why should it be like this? Why could it not be like that? It's that kind of um, position, I think, that I have. There really isn't anything I do that isn't effectively drawing, and that's the aspect of drawing that interests me, that one draws not because one knows or to describe, but because one seeks to discover. And the process of discovery is a drawing process. So what you're really doing is uh, going from drawing to sculpture, photography, to drawing to sculpture, so it's ricocheting. So when you wind up with, finally, a photographic work, there are collections of images that are composed in a way that become a larger whole than any single image. Why use photography to go away from the graphic? I can't say I'm clear about that, but I am deeply attracted to paradox. All of these pieces I've been developing with water. Another water saying water, some Thames, dictionary of water. The big paradox with water is here is the most intimate substance you've known since before your consciousness, and yet it remains unfamiliar. And it's the lack of that knowledge that keeps it vivid and alive. And of course, trying to photograph it is an absurdity, which I enjoy, because the way I'm photographing water breaks down the descriptive, and water becomes a form of everything. It just opens up. The more I went into it, the more unknown there was. Over the years, I've been going to Iceland, and in about 88, 87, I started to use a camera in Iceland. And what I did was I photographed, in a very traditional documentary way, the sheepfolds in the landscape, and they're located in the most obscure parts of Iceland. But the real subject for me was my relationship to the landscape. How does a place become a lifestyle? Very early on in my travels there, I knew that I needed to maintain a relationship to this place because I felt how profoundly it made me feel myself in the world. 
And this became part of a series of books called Two Place, which is an ongoing enterprise that I've, I started in 1989 and I continue with to this day. So the first volume, which was called Bluff Life, it actually recorded a collection of drawings I made when I was staying in a lighthouse in southern Iceland for a few months. And it was up on a bluff overlooking the ocean. It was quite an exquisite location. It had such a strong visceral feeling. It was the experience of this place where the landscape was palpable. And the weather really defines the sense of place in Iceland. You always had the cloud cover sitting on the land and it would, you know, raise up a little, you'd see a peak. Come back a year later, you see another part of that landscape. You know, the clouds had moved over. I was very attached to not being able to see anything in Iceland. Because there I had, of course, my imagination of what was out there. As an American, you're brought up to think that what you cannot see does not exist. It has an enormous influence on the look of things. There are many things out there, literally, like the Arctic Circle, which are not visible, but they're present. You have a location, you have a scale, you have all the physical properties of the visible, but yet it's invisible. And I spent absurdly, but also very seriously, many years traveling up along the Arctic Circle in Iceland. And I found a high point in this landscape, which coincidentally was on the property of Hilda and Bjorn. And I photographed down onto the ocean where the map indicated the Arctic Circle intersected. The house was completely isolated. It was a home built in 1917. It was completely intact. It was like walking into another century. But the upstairs, which had this unbelievable view of the world, I mean, you're looking out across the window and you really felt like the ocean was gonna be washing you away at any minute. I was able to get photographs of, of the clear horizon and then as the fog started to soften and kind of erase the the view a little bit. It has a kind of end of the world feeling mixed with extreme purity and kind of beauty, just raw beauty. That really kind of keyed me to what the subject of the work was, which was this collection of circular and cyclical events. One of the things that I became incredibly fascinated with, Hilda and Bjorn, who were in their 70s when I was photographing them, were making their living by harvesting eider down. This room was used for their harvest. They would collect all the down, they would pack it, and they would send it off to Reykjavik to sell. And of course, Hilda and Bjorn became the obvious cycle of life and death. So here we have in the work pie, which is the installation, we have 45 images, and it's hung about a foot above eye level. Hanging the work significantly higher than is comfortable to look at pushes the viewer back into the center of the room, and you tend to look at the flow of relationships among these images and not at the single images. And they become a circle around the viewer very much the way horizon in a completely open area. The most important motif is the Arctic Circle itself and the horizon. Then you had portraits of Hilda and Bjorn, you had eiderdown nests, 
You had the daily weather cycle. You had guiding light. And when I was uh, spending time with Hilda and Bjorn, they watched Guiding Light at 5 o'clock every evening. It's a soap opera from the United States, and uh, it became also one of the daily cycles. The work You Are the Weather is the 100 images that are mounted on a, like a plastic material and then they're glued to the wall. And they are hung more or less at eye level and very densely, so just a few inches apart and a slightly larger interval for each sequence. Roughly 15 different sequences, some in color, some in black and white. And each sequence is anywhere from five to seven or eight images. These images here, the one I'm looking at right now is kind of this classical, almost Greek look. The one over here is more like almost androgynous uh, looking portrait or, or face and so on. So I've compressed the range of expression. I've edited out the far reaches. We were always outside. She was always in the naturally heated waters. But the presence of humidity, mist, fog, or rain in some cases, allowed me at least to imagine that I could record visually this very fine level of reciprocity between a person and the place they're in. In this way, the subtleties and the nuance become a little bit more prominent and also it kind of acclimatizes the viewer to a more delicate vocabulary in viewing the work. Ellipsis is a photographic uh, work. It consists of 64 images which are tiled into a square, eight by eight feet like a chessboard. This building was uh, built in the 20s, and it's associated with uh, the very popular uh, Icelandic activity of swimming. And uh, there's a very beautiful swimming pool that it leads on to. But this uh, locker room was especially fascinating. It was a labyrinth of doors that were both open and closed. It was a tiled structure. It had no edges. It was an extremely visually fluid space that is in effect totally transparent. The choice of black and white in this case was for two reasons. One, the actual architecture is quite monochromatic. It's a, it's a white tile uh, with metal detailing. I also felt that using color would lead in a more descriptive direction than I wanted. I was kind of trying to understand the space uh, from the photograph, and so I mapped it out from memory. Because of all the chambers were basically identical, I could shift in space, but effectively have an identical image with really only minute circumstantial differences. And this installation is dotted with peepholes, and you look at the numbers of the peephole, but then once you look in the peephole, you can see the numbers of other peepholes. It was like a, a mathematical equation punctuated by a sexual act. And the way this space was designed, you really felt that this architect was a master chessman. I suppose that, uh, you know, in looking at the entire range of my work, I would say that it's been the work of an escape artist. 
that something about me really forces me to camouflage myself against the potential that someone will ever know who I am or what I do. When I'm out photographing, I never try and hide who I am or what I'm doing. I have quite a big camera. I have a flash gun on the camera. I just wander around and um, photograph who I see. When I started in photography, black and white was the dominant medium. And I think it must have been when I was 13 or 14 when I first got the serious photography bug. After I left college, I moved about three to four years later, to a small town called Hebden Bridge, which lies between Bradford and Manchester. And in particular, I looked at things like small non-conformist chapels, very slowly and quietly closing down. And I picked these out as being a way of looking at very traditional aspects of life in England at the time. I came from a very middle-class background, so I, I think the idea of connecting with a community in a different way to what you have from suburban Surrey was such a contrast to me and therefore it was very appealing. This was um, an inaugural banquet for the new mayor of Todmorden. He knew that the best opportunity, photographic opportunity that was, was this few minutes where people would charge for the banquet. And of course I'd be ready and waiting, waiting for the shot and here you can just see as I've gone along, I've suddenly got everything where it just falls into place and all the hands coming in. And I suppose the thing that makes this is this guy carrying a pork pie in a cupped hand and the awkwardness of the cluster of people on the left as a woman tries to get out and the other woman tries to come in. So it's these little details which show the sort of real feeling and sense of trying to grab food from a banquet. Later on, I decided that I would sh start shooting in colour and go up a format. And when I started doing colour in 82, I never did black and white again. It was at the time that Mrs Thatcher had just started and become uh, Prime Minister, and she was telling us what a great country we were again. So I liked this idea of picking out a very run-down town or seaside resort near to Liverpool and showing how the whole fabric of the country had gone into disarray and was falling apart. And yet, of course, normal life goes on. So in front of these backdrops, of litter and of decay, I would put these families going on their days out, enjoying themselves. And what I found interesting, of course, was the juxtaposition between the foreground people and the background and things falling apart. Of course, the most productive days were the busiest days, where there'd be more litter, there'd be more people. This meant I had in front of me all these scenes of chaos and queues and people very desperate to get a burger and a drink. And it just meant that I had access to that sort of point of vulnerability that I'm always looking for to sort of show the poignancy of um, what's happening in society. In the mid-80s, I did a whole series of photographs about 
British people going to France to buy very cheap beer and duty-free items. This is Ocean Hypermarket in Boulogne. There was such demand for beer that sometimes it would actually run out. So people would literally be quite desperate to make sure that their trolley would be full before they got to the checkout. You can see here, I'm wandering around, and then suddenly this woman comes along and pulls out the uh, Stella Artois. And I like the expression on her face, a mixture of sort of despotism and heroicism. She's so desperate to get hold of a beer, it's, it saved her life by grabbing it. You can see it's slightly off tilt, and this is just to give a, an emphasis of the disorder and the dysfunctional nature of, of being in a hypermarket when it's completely chaotic. I think it's important now to look at aspects like the wealth of the Western world rather than just the problems that you find in the third world and indeed wars and famines and such subjects which are more traditional subjects for photographers. But I'm a very big hypocrite insofar that I'm making things and objects which become part of the thing that if you read my photographs carefully I'm preaching against. So I love the fact that my work is surrounded by hypocrisy and prejudice and all these things that people don't expect photographers to be pursuing. This is from the project from A to B which looked at how people had a relationship with their cars and how couples argue when they're driving. So this couple came forward and volunteered to be photographed. So I've got the guy to look at me, to stare at me, and I've asked the woman to look straight forward and to look pretty miserable, because the whole point of this couple is that we know that they argue when they're driving, which is a very common trait, because even Susie and I might argue when we're driving, because Susie's a terrible map reader. You know, there are certain things that men are good at, map reading and barbecuing. The idea of boring is, is really fascinating. And in the world where we're given more and more distractions, more and more things to look at and to keep our attention scan, which is getting less and less, the idea of something being boring for the sake of it is very appealing to me. This was when I was shooting the Bored Couple project and I was looking particularly for couples who are appearing to be bored with each other. And the idea behind this was this notion of what a bunch of lies photographs are, because we look at couples, we assume they may be bored, but we don't know if they are at all. Part of the motive for this is to challenge the idea of what photographers say about the photographs, to make a very provocative statement about the photographs which in fact I've tried to undermine by showing myself as appearing to be bored, but knowing full well that it's a big lie, that in fact I was very excited. Well, I'm interested in taking pictures, curating pictures, manipulating pictures, so part of my work is to explore this, not only with my own pictures, but with other people's pictures and all sort of populist forms of photographies. So the idea of boring postcards just came along as a notion because it demonstrates very well how social attitudes have changed in the 30 to 40 years that most of these postcards were produced. In fact, the project took off enormously. And it's because of that that I decided to go to the town of Boring in Oregon, in America. And I made a pilgrimage. So I photographed every single thing, building, street, house, shop, shop counter, in Boring, and then put together a huge album of 468 pictures, which I then called Boring Photographs.
Well, tourism is the biggest industry in the world, so it seemed uh, inevitable in one sense that I should uh, look at this as a subject. And the great thing about um, tourism is the expectation of what a place will be like, and then the reality of how a place looks and feels are often very different. So the basic concept of this project is to explore the difference between expectation and reality. Because I travel a lot for my photography, over the years I'd noticed that um, there was fantastic studios that would have quite incredible photographs. But of course you can't really go in and buy other people's photographs. So I decided to have my own portrait taken over a period of years. I sit in the photograph. I always uh, insist on not smiling, although many of the photographers try and make you smile. I try and make my pose very similar in order to highlight the differences between the approaches and techniques that these uh, studio photographers use. So in a sense, this project called Autoportrait became a celebration of the basic studio photograph um, throughout the world and the different ways in which people would do this. Digital, hand-colored, colored, black and white, um, kitsch, posh, all the different ways in which people would have their photographs taken. In 1995, I changed from using uh, a 6x7 camera to a much smaller format, 35mm, because I was very interested in exploring the idea of coming in a lot closer to the subject. And together with that, I had a ring flash. This is a flash where you have a flash on either side of the lens, so you therefore get very even lighting, almost like a portable studio. Over a period of about three to four years, I accumulated a lot of photographs in this style and then put them together into a project called Common Sense, which is where I made an installation of um, laser copies of these pictures. And because they were very cheap to do, it was shown in 43 different locations simultaneously. And this, therefore, was perfect conceptually for the type of work that it was. It was cheap, nasty, colorful, bright, and ubiquitous. This is from the project Think of England and I did this in the late 90s and it gave me an opportunity to look at England and to put into one set of pictures my confusion and ambiguity that I feel about England. England's a place that I both am very fond of and indeed am part of, but sometimes I get very annoyed by it. So this picture shows uh, someone eating a bacon sandwich. If you're eating a bacon sandwich, the bacon rind is really annoying. And here it demonstrates someone's trying to get rid of the bacon by teasing it out with their teeth and trying to flick it off. But it's not always a very easy thing to do. If you look at it uh, objectively, it's a very revolting photo. But also, it's a very affectionate photo because it reminds us that we're all part of the sort of bigger scheme of things. And it's something like bacon rind that joins us all together. However, superior we may feel, or indeed inferior, we still have the same problems with bacon rind. Even the Queen would have a problem with bacon rind. Although perhaps she has someone cut it off for her.
Dans mon histoire, d'abord... In my work, the abandoned place was first a playground. Puis comme sujet Then a photographic subject. Et finalement... And finally a space, an artist studio. Atelier d'artiste. At first, these places were vestiges of war, fortifications in the Lorraine region. And then, later on, in the city, they became warehouses, abandoned buildings, offices, slaughterhouses, hospitals. And so I used these spaces like a studio, in which I organized a mise en scène of painting and which I photographed, photography being the memory of this place and the memory of what had happened in this place. I started off with this very simple approach, this first phase using figurative painting. I'd arrive in the morning with my paint pots, camera, and go to work on the walls. I painted these figures as though they were self-portraits, a period of doubt and excitement which I expressed via these bodies floating, somewhat aggravated in space. And then immediately afterwards, I used spaces in which through linum paint I created sculptural forms. Comme des sculptures. Ce sont des, des formes These were forms which became part of a pillar or which occupied a central place in the space I was photographing, the space in which I worked. And so these forms were simply drawn, hatched out in chalk. Et puis ensuite, il y a and then next, there was a long period where I used paint to create various transparent shapes, different forms. There's the whole exploratory aspect of the place. I go in, there's a photographic area which is quite vast and in which I can see myself intervening. And at this moment, I start imagining something. I've always used Polaroids to fix a place before starting work on it, to fix the final composition. And so I can follow, not on a daily basis, but quite regularly as the work evolves, its progress, the elements as they fall into place. I've always used a large format camera with a 4x5 inch chamber, an optical system with bellows, glass viewfinder, and visually, when I look through the viewfinder, I can see the image of the space I'm looking at inverted, because it's a direct optical system, there isn't a mirror in between to set the image right. On the viewfinder, I trace the form I want to reproduce, then I reproduce point by point that form in space, going back and forth between the space and the viewfinder. The space is discontinuous. There are walls, intermediate partitions, beams, all these elements are in relief. I need to imagine the space as flat, because the final image must be flat.
Et puis, je me suis And then I realized how crucial architecture was to my work. So, I first said to myself, if the space is too small, then I'll cut into the walls, enlarge the space in which I find myself. I'll try to restore to the space a dimension which already exists, but which was divided up according to the needs of the place. And I said to myself, why not build elements which have no other function than to capture light and finally create a discontinuous plane so as to express a kind of photographic substance. So then I started to build using a circular form because circular forms allow for a certain freedom because the spaces in which we live are usually orthogonal, vertical and horizontal and the curve is not included, at least very rarely. And then I thought I'd draw a second circle, and in doing so, create a sort of ring, two concentric circles. But at the same time, these two circles determine a center, and it's like a sort of metaphor of the eye or of the lens, which let us see. For me, the forms I present are immediately visible and readable in the photograph. They are frontal, and when, on looking at the image, you see flaws, in an instant, you enter the space through these imperfections, and you deconstruct the space, and you see that a single form runs through a wall, through several walls, ten walls, if need be. And finally, in the form I've drawn, I will use a single uniform color to harmonize all these different depths and reliefs. Toutes ces profondeurs et tous ces reliefs différents. I photograph what exists in a real place, what has really materialized. But the images I create cannot speak as to what is really happening in this space. And then I gradually realized that my work had become more complex, enriched, and in addition to my photographic record, I now had notebooks of drawings, projects, writing, to the point where I decided to copy what these notebooks contained onto the walls in the spaces in which I worked, as though they were spoken words, sounds to complement the image. In Italy, in Rome, I did a whole series of works entitled Embrasure. So these works evoked the sun, the incandescence of the sun. The subject is central. It questions the nature of light, so necessary to photography. What is it? Where does it come from? A questioning about the world. Donc, Thus, the sun, which is millions of kilometers away, is a ball of flaming fire, which I tried to regenerate, reproduce in this place I worked in. I painted the walls completely red, a cinnabar red, which in Italian means ash, embers. And so I started painting the part of the room the camera sees. But then I actually painted the entire space, the floor, the walls, the ceiling, to have a total physical experience, as if dazzled by the sun. When I close my eyes, the image persists on the retina, and the inner world is entirely red. And in these abandoned places, one could feel this, while being at the same time totally isolated from the outside world. Red is so powerful, it's the heart of incandescence. And it was this kind of inner experience of light which I tried to get across. 
Et en même temps, And at the same time as I worked on Embrasure, I wrote, in my notebook, thoughts on painting, on space, a little about death, on solitude. And in the end, I said to myself, why not write directly on the walls and on the floor? And so you see some of these works with a text in perspective written all over the floor whose meaning is no longer comprehensible, but where certain words allow for a second meaning, parallel to the real meaning. For me, a piece is a concentrate of meditations, poetic moments, work, paint, light, photography. It's something which seems almost immaterial. And I imagine that it is this which produces the spiritual in art. I go walking in the mountains of Nepal quite regularly. And I asked myself how I could bring these journeys into my work, how I could bring in these walks in this landscape, which, in a different way, are also moments of meditation and poetry. And it was using ordnance survey maps, which are a kind of abstract, almost scientific representation of the real world, of reality, that I reproduced in the spaces using contour lines and the directions in the map, instead of color or chalk marks, the landscapes I have walked in. All my works are named after the city in which the work was done, with the year. So, for me, the problematic changes, shifts, according to the country I'm working in. The moment I became an artist, I immediately began to travel. And I said to myself, OK, mine is going to be a kind of wandering life, so I'll mark the spot where I am and try to create a network around the world of the places I've been, meaning that, in the end, I will have appropriated the nowhere. I began photography in a very naive way. And the more I photographed, the more I realized that intimate and personal subjects didn't interest me, and that I preferred instead to say something about the world we live in. The real subject of my work is history, meaning the question of the relation between personal and collective experience, how people live together. It was here that began my interest in cities, a phenomenon which concerns each one of us. So far, I've photographed about 50 cities, some of which have a very important role to play in my work, like Naples and Rome, for instance. 
Neapel spielt eine besondere Rolle für mich, weil die Geschichte da präsent ist. Naples particularly interested me because several centuries of history can be found in the way people live from day to day. People live in streets which go back to the medieval period and the centuries which followed. The city's entire architecture seems to follow a random plan. In Rome, on the other hand, it's how the state represents itself which has dominated and left its mark on the city for two or three thousand years. This is how it contrasts with Naples. For me, streets represent the unconscious in a way. And I think that in my street photographs, the emptiness of space is related to what Walter Benjamin called the scene of the crime. This means that streets and cities in which men have lived still remain, and their history can be read. It's as if the actors have left the stage for half an hour or half a day, but the show still goes on. I'm also concerned with showing places with a certain historical resonance, because the fact that I'm German and that I was born in 1954 is a problem for me. Our entire environment still bears the traces of a history shattered by fascism and the war. Most of my street photographs are in black and white because they are abstractions. They aren't large images either. Their format is 50 by 60 centimeters. It's like a sort of text to be read. I should also add that the black and white format creates a particularly intense focus. It's like a magnifying glass. And this focusing effect is not simply a matter of light. It's above all a mental process. In my Japanese and Chinese street scenes, I often show people because in Asian cities, public life unfolds mainly in the street. And sometimes it's important to let the nature of the subject speak for itself. In an Asian country, nothing would be more absurd than waiting for the street to be empty. In 1987, in Tokyo, I found myself in the Shibuya district, which particularly interested me because of the way in which advertising space interacts with architectural elements. And in the same year, because color has an important role to play, I started using color to photograph this area. It's a perfect and a vehement sort of model of our contemporary world. After architectural images, after street photos, I finally came to portraiture. Concerning portraits, I've always tried to avoid merely showing outer appearances and take a risk of showing a singular and authentic moment in the persons I photograph. In each photograph, the moment itself should be readable for the viewer. Man 
What really interests me here is what radiates from people, meaning the state in which they find themselves when I take their photograph. I don't photograph strangers, only people I know, that I've already met, and of whom I already have an idea as to what I feel for them. And while I photograph them, their state of mind is in a constant flux. Later, when I look at the negatives and contact sheets, I notice that in certain shots, for that split second, people are absent elsewhere. What's also important is that they have adopted a protective attitude. The fact that they're always looking at the camera and that they know they're about to be photographed gives them a certain strength and a certain stability in relation to themselves and the space they're in. This photo shows Hannah Erdrich Hartmann and her daughter Jana Maria Hartmann. This is a photograph of Hannah Hertha Hartmann and her daughter Jana Maria taken in 1987. Jana Maria was around five years old, but in a certain way the protective impulse that the mother feels for her child has been inverted. The little girl has her arm around her mother's neck, while the mother's expression is an open one. If the little girl looks pensive, it's perhaps because she still does not know what is going to happen. Also, both of them are about 50 centimeters from the lens. They're extremely close to me and my camera. However, their faces express calm. Though from one negative to the next, their expressions change. Here we see another pose from the same sitting. The little girl is a bit absent, her gaze a little too passive, too detached from the situation she finds herself in. So I didn't use this photo. It's at this moment of the encounter that the crucial questions arise. Have we managed to create an atmosphere and will the composition be the best one? As for the subjects themselves, they always find the poses that suit them in the end. In the field of portraiture, I've always been interested in family portraits. It's a subject which has to do with the fact that family is something that no one can ignore which also means that history is also shaped by the family. In two other series of photos I did, the one on museums but also on churches, the people I photographed in a way represent the visitors who come to see my images. The choice of the different museum goers plays a key role. There's a certain similarity between the people in the paintings and those standing before them and before my camera. And without this resemblance, the photographs would be worthless, wouldn't exist. The artworks you can see in churches are in a way displayed in their places of origin. To put it another way, they are authentically rooted, so that the opposition between the works themselves and their function, as in museums and in books, is non-existent. It 
It's also a kind of milestone in the history of man's relationship to the image. It could be said that up to a certain point, images embodied religious objects. During the Renaissance, a process of disintegration began. Images continued to have a religious function, but they were no longer considered sacred objects. This marked a real change in historical thinking. Photographing landscapes and plants was for me a sort of liberation from the visual parameters which had served me until then. After streets, families, museums, it was like being immersed in a deeper element of life. The 90s were a decade in which the political conflict between East and West came to an end. It was as though we had to start again from scratch. How do we want to live? And what sort of paradise do we want? So I then thought that paradise should look like a jungle. The jungle is our starting point, but it prevents us from seeing what we must do. It's a sort of metaphor. I thought about a title for a long time, and I felt that paradise was best suited in order to express a certain irony. But I feel that nowadays the ability to read my photographs is very underdeveloped. And it's for this reason that in photography it's very important to speak a precise language so as to avoid misunderstanding. Photography was uh, actually the last thing that I ever wanted to be. As a teenager, I tried out um, all sorts of art forms as um, a means of expression. Then in um, 1986, I discovered a predecessor of the color laser copier, which we now know. And these works on the photocopier were um, an exploration into why and um, how does meaning get into this paper. So I approached photography through its degradation and, and analysis in the truest sense of the word. I realized that uh, the photographs that I took for making these photocopy works were actually more interesting than this technical filter. In the late 80s, there was suddenly a whole new type of dance music, what you call acid house explosion. I realized, you know, that I'm actually now in the middle of a youth movement that was never there before. I had this strong desire to uh, sort of show <laughs> the broader world um, how, you know, this is an alternative to the normal lives people live. Looking for definitions of identity was clearly a, a major driving force in, in my work in the early and mid-90s. I think the sort of two positions, the 
individual and the crowd. It's the framework in which I experience life. It's the the one-to-one -one experience, starting from myself. I look for what people share, rather than what what divides us. I make my work coming from two different angles. One is, um, is a pure formal visual interest, inventing new pictures. And on the other hand, I want what I do to have a social impact, to somehow not be politically neutral. I do find that conventions are there to be tested, and that's what I use when I um, show um, deviant behavior or, <laughs> or want to challenge conventions. Like this uh, picture of um, Alex and Lutz, uh, where he looks at, uh, at her crotch, you know, where he's sort of bending over and, and uh, looking between her legs. You know, it's already a reality, you know, it's like a parallel world. Say with portraiture. I'm not interested in, in pictures where I feel that the photographer has not risked him or herself as much as the sitter. When I go into a portrait situation, I don't have a psychological safety net. I need to be as vulnerable as the sitter in order for something to come out. What's uh, fascinating about portraiture is to get a glimpse of uh, the fragility of a person combined with um, a sense of their strength and beauty. This is called Like Praying, one and two, from 1994. It is uh, a diptych that I took in, um, in two parts. It is a reflection on two observations I made in the same year. The position of prayer, that this position is similar to one assumed in certain S&M scenes. This submission to God and submission to a dominant sex partner uh, ultimately has the same physical shape. The bottom one was, was first, and that was a self-portrait. I just used myself as an actor in, in the picture. The other one was a month later, using a friend called Paul. And one is by daylight, and the other is uh, at night with a flashlight. But because the shape and the location is exactly the same, there's, I think, also the slight coldness of the top picture with a slight warmness of the bottom picture, which, again, is a contrast the eye likes. And so the two become a couple, even though they are such uh, different pictures when you look at them. The life, for me, is a, is a delicate act it's like a walk on a tightrope, you know, using the things as uh, even even as symbols, but then undermining their clear meaning. Still lives come from often from objects of the everyday life. 
things that, that surround me, but that I have somehow arranged over time. The main fascination I have with um, view from above is that you can see these millions of individual decisions that uh, people have taken over the years. And it brings me into perspective uh, with myself. The strange thing that I observed that I've done even as a child or, or teenager, you know, the things that moved me first somehow stuck with me. And my very first uh, visual in initiation was astronomy. Every night uh, that was a clear sky, I spent out looking at the stars through the telescope. Visually, I was um, very at home in this very abstract world. To know that abstraction comes from somewhere deep inside me and has a, has a real foundation in my experience, somehow um, I find that um, it helps the work for me. Now with the abstract work, I use the viewer's insistence that it must be something that they look at. I use this um, impulse and show things that actually, uh, you know, are not figurative. And uh, the desire to see something in these pictures uh, m uh, then makes them figurative. And so the, the people come up with all sorts of um, associations which, um, which they wouldn't if, um, if it was a canvas. With the abstract work, I do exactly what photography is designed to do. It's designed to collect light. The picture of the sky, um, the 56 Concorde pictures, for example, um, are also color field pictures. To me, that was always clear that this is also an abstract picture. I think um, working with the picture, making the picture, defining what the picture is and what the subject is and making it is uh, one half of my work. But the other half is uh, contextualizing it in space, thinking about it, how can I um, present it. I found that showing my photographs in galleries allowed me to do things that I couldn't do on the printed page. In the end, uh, a map forms on the wall uh, where, you know, little place, spaces uh, can maybe take that picture and then if these three uh, create an in interesting dialogue uh, if they are close together. I also want the viewer to uh, be free to attribute value to the object. Besides photographs, I also um, do installation pieces and video works. When I'm standing in a nightclub on my own, I often stare at the lights and observe how they move like these little robots. You know, it's all about sex and body and dancing and drinking and social interaction. But at the heart of it, 
is also, you know, the light, just pure abstract light.